Earlier this year, Look launched their latest and greatest bike, the Blade 795 RS. This one, in fact, allowing us to have a close look at the tech and also take you for a spin. Wait, wait, I've got, I've got another one. What is he doing here? And what on earth is he wearing? I brought another bike, look. This is a KG86, the first carbon fiber bike to win the Tour de France. Hang on a minute, you've got Greg Le Mans 1986 Tour de France winning bike. No wonder you're wearing La Vie Claire kit. Well, where did you get it, mate? Uh, I, I, I borrowed it from uh, Lux factory. Do they know you borrowed it? Uh... Well, I'll look after it. Seriously though, Look have kindly supplied us with this iconic bike to allow us to compare carbon bikes from the first to the very latest generation. And no, it's not Le Mans' own bike, but it is cut from the same cloth, almost literally, with its knitted carbon tubes produced by TVT that Look then bonded into alloy lugs. Now the history buffs among you will no doubt point out that Le Monde actually won on Campagnolo kit, whereas this bike has a rather rare Mavic group set instead. But don't be too harsh, I had to leave in quite a, a, a hurry and just grab whatever I could. To see what difference 32 years of engineering progress have made, it seems only fitting, Ollie, that we go for a ride. Yeah, I think we should probably go for a coffee first. This isn't quite as rideable as it used to be. We say quite as rideable. Is it rideable? Yeah, not really, no. When you think about what makes a bike good, attributes like price, weight, stiffness, comfort, aerodynamics all spring to mind. Now, which of these is most important to you will depend on the kind of riding that you enjoy the most. But in the case of the KG86, a bike that won the Tour de France, speed is the most important thing. 32 years ago, this was arguably the fastest bike in the world. You would think, wouldn't you, with the benefit of modern technology, that we would be very easily able to actually quantify the difference between these two bikes. And we very nearly can. On this bike, we can tell you exactly how much power is required to ride at a certain speed, thanks to the very swanky new Look SRM power meter. On that one, though, we're very quickly reminded about just how far technology has come by the fact that no power meter will fit on it. Unfortunately, we can't fit the swanky new Look SRM exact pedals to the KG86 because the pedal spindle diameter on the cranks is smaller. But I have managed to get some rather cool pedals on here. I've got the original clipless pedals, the Look PP65. Check these out, how cool are they? They are super cool, Ollie, super cool. And even if I did have a power meter on this bike, I still wouldn't be able to ride it really fast to see how fast it can go because, well, it's a museum piece. Yeah. We just have to make do with going fast on one then, eh? Whoa! Woohoo! While Sai is off doing the road cycling equivalent of donuts and power slides, I've returned to the warmth of the cafe. This is a genuine piece of history and I don't want to push our look with it. In fact, it's the same age as me and I know firsthand just how much care and attention you need to lavish on 32 year olds. But in all seriousness, I also want to tell you a bit more about this KG86 because when this was launched, it was a total game changer. Those tubes, as we mentioned, were made by TVT, which apparently stands for 
tube verretis, which means tubes of knitted glass. Now legend has it that the DVT tubes were actually made by the sister company, DCT, which stands for Technique Carbon Tis, techniques of knitting carbon. But how are those tubes made? Well, each tube consists of seven stockings of carbon and one layer of Kevlar fibre, which is there to resist shocks and breakages, and it gives a seamless tube. Now, each one of those stockings was placed over a steel mandrel that was the shape of the desired tube. Stockings were then placed in a mould and epoxy resin was forced in and around the stockings until it was full. Once full, it was then left and set aside to cure and the result was a very rigid tube. Well, you say that, Ollie, but to a certain extent, that's just a bike made using technology that already existed in frame building, only with different materials. So instead of steel tubes and steel lugs, you've got carbon and aluminium. In fact, to say that these two bikes are made out of the same material is almost a bit misleading, such as the extent to which carbon fibre technology has improved since then. I mean, the KG86, in fact, was actually superseded just two years later at Look, when they made a frame out of carbon fibre in its entirety. Weirdly, not called the KG88, despite the year that it was released, but the KG96. But anyway, it's been the carbon fibres and the resins that have improved and diversified, but perhaps most significantly, it's actually the manufacturing techniques that when they moved to monocoque designs. So, whereas that KG86 has been made using those woven tube sections, on this blade, 405 pieces of individual flat carbon fibre has been painstakingly cut and laid up by hand to make the ultimate 3D jigsaw puzzle. What that means in practice is that you can make more complex shapes and you can put more material in areas where you need it, so for stiffness and for strength, and then take it away from areas that you don't in order to save weight. Whereas on that KG86, you have uniform tube sections with uniform strength mean that actually you've got weight in areas where it will be of no benefit. The other benefit to using individual pieces of carbon fibre is that you can actually tailor the types of fibres to certain areas. So you might want stiffer, perhaps more brittle fibres in certain locations and certain orientations, and then you might want flexible ones in others. Well, yes, but does it improve ride quality? Honestly, it's incredibly hard to say. Not only is the frame different, but also the wheels are vastly different too. You've also got a completely different saddle, bars and stem. Modern carbon bikes have a different ride quality to vintage ones, but with wider tyres and greater compliance built into the frame, it's hard to argue that they're not more comfortable. I am glad we got into compliance because a criticism that's often been levelled at the earliest generations of aero bikes was that they were a little bit harsh to ride. And actually it's a criticism that they're still trying to shrug off to this day. It's not surprising perhaps that they were, given that the frame designers were putting all their efforts into creating frame shapes that would actually save you energy, as opposed to just saving your backside. Look said though that with this bike, they wanted to create not just an aero bike, but a super aero all round bike. And as such, engineering compliance into it was one of their priorities. The idea being that it will improve comfort, but also traction, they said, which wasn't something I'd ever thought about, but it kind of makes sense, really. If your frame is too stiff, it'll leave you rattling around all over the place and your back tire bouncing around instead of driving you forwards. If you want to see how they've done it, you've got to look at the rear triangle. So they got rid of the brake bridge on the rim brake version. Obviously, you don't need a brake bridge on a disc version anyway, but by doing so, they create these super long C stays giving maximum room for compliance. And then also, something we've already touched on but you can't see, is actually the carbon layup and also 
the choices of fibers used. Right. Does it work? Well, it certainly seems to. To be fair though, it does feel like we're kind of skirting around the edge of the issue here. We are comparing, after all, a Tour de France winning bike with another bike that'd be worthy of any champion to ride it. And so with that in mind, we've got to talk about speed. And when we are talking about speed, there can only be one winner. Aero has the edge any day. Hang on a minute, you might be thinking. All this new aero bike stuff can't be right. Look at the skinnier, rounder tubes on a bike like the KG86. They present much less frontal area than the wider, girthier aerofoil shapes like on a bike like the Blade. Well, I thought you might say that. So here is an aerodynamics textbook. Let's have a look at the first page. Cylinders, or cylindrical shaped objects, are not very aerodynamic at all. They create loads of turbulent air and drag. An aerofoil shape that's the same width or even wider creates significantly less turbulence and drag. They're much faster. So there you have it. Cylindrical shape objects are, well, about as aerodynamic as a barn door. The aerodynamic shapes of bikes like the RS Blade are determined over several design stages. Firstly, the geometry and tube shapes have to fall within certain parameters set out by the UCI. Next, prototype tube shapes are drawn up in a computer and then put through computational fluid dynamic simulations, or CFD for short. It's not as complicated as it sounds. Think of it as, well, a virtual reality wind tunnel in the matrix. Sounds cool. What it does ultimately is it allows engineers to very quickly test a huge variety of tube shapes to find which ones are the most promising, whereby they can then print or make prototypes, take them to the wind tunnel to verify the CFD calculations. Now, a lot was known about aerodynamics in 1986. Let's say that's not new technology. I mean, a Boeing 747 first took off in 1969. And that, to my eyes, is pretty aero. But what's made a difference for bikes is the advancement in carbon fibre manufacturing, allowing engineers to create whatever shape is necessary and still not add vast amounts of weight. If you've never ridden an aero bike before, then you can be forgiven for wondering just how much difference it makes. And I will honestly say, hand on heart, that you can feel the difference as soon as you spin up to speed. It really is quite incredible. How much difference it would have made to Greg LeMond in 1986 is an interesting question. How much faster could he have gone on this bike? It's a good question. Now, we haven't been able to put the two bikes in a wind tunnel to compare them, but sensible estimations can be made. So testing of modern aero bikes against modern climbing bikes have consistently shown that when they've been fitted with the same wheels, there's a difference in aero drag of around 15 watts at 45 kilometers an hour. So you can expect that the difference between our two bikes we have here is likely to be around 20 watts and that's a, well, a sensible and conservative estimate. Yeah, and whilst 45 k an hour might sound pretty quick, remember we're putting this in the context of a Tour de France winner. Now, yes, as the leader of a stage race, you're unlikely to be on the front or solo for much of the time where you would be reaping the full benefit of your aero bike. But even in the bunch, there's still significant savings to be made, meaning that over the course of a three-week Grand Tour, you could therefore be fresher for the key moments, so your mountain stages and also your time trials. You know what, when I see these two bikes side by side like this, I'm reminded of looking at a modern supercar, but whereas that is very much a bike of the mid 80s, it doesn't look like an 80s supercar. It looks, it looks like a car from the 60s, doesn't it? No, this is no Ferrari Testarossa, but evolution happened pretty quickly once the carbon bandwagon got rolling. 
The Lamborghini Countach moment, if you will, happened just four years later when Look launched its first carbon monocoque frame, the KG196. That still looks cool as yeah. to this very day, doesn't it? Now, I promise, Look, that I have not ridden that bike in anger, but even just pootling around a car park, it feels very much like a classic car. I mean, you kind of don't really get much positivity through your steering, let's say, certainly compared to this. And so I've got to say that I am 100% a modern bike kind of bike rider. What about yeah. you? Well, we've got a ride home and I, I want this. I want to take this one. I, I know it's not as light and as stiff and as aero side, but just look at it. It's beautiful. It's cycling heritage. It is cycling heritage, I will grant you. But then this is gonna be cycling heritage in the not too distant future. And look at it, it is beautiful and it is stiff and it is fast. Yeah, and if you wanna see how it's made actually, Ollie did a cracking video at the Look Factory where you get to see, well, 405 pieces being laid up individually by hand. You can get through to that by clicking on screen a little bit later. We better crack on, mate. Yeah. Have you, what have you done with your jacket, by the way? Uh, I don't know what you're doing with yours. I just left it in the calf. Right, onwards. Oh! Go on, on, mate. Hang on. Got a mechanical. How many bits of cake did you eat? 